All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 20th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. Continuing on with the, uh, the depreciation, the diminishment of the cross in what's called Christianity. How many churches in the United States really have nothing to do with Jesus Christ and him crucified? How many preachers never preach Christ and him crucified? Think of Joel Osteen and his church. What does Joel Osteen have to do with Jesus Christ and him crucified? Does he preach that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Joel Osteen is, has nothing to do with Christianity. Not at all. Because Christianity is Christ and Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead. It's all about Jesus Christ. If the focus is not on Jesus Christ, it's not his church because he is the head of the church. He is the, without him, it's nothing but a club, some kind of club. I don't know what kind of club, but it's not his church. And Joel Osteen's an obvious example what does he have to do? Even secular people ask the question, what does this have to do with the gospel and Jesus Christ? It has nothing to do with the gospel and Jesus Christ. As, as is demonstrated by the fact that, that him and many others have a big rotating globe in the front of their auditorium, their arena, rather than a cross. They have the world because that's what they're all about, the world. They're not about the cross. See, the cross offends people because it, it displays the price of saving sinners, the death of the Son of God. All right, we're going to look at something a little more subtle than Joe Osteen. Uh, there are many, many false teachers. Let's go to the Scripture first. Let's go to the Scripture, go through some Scriptures to set the stage for this. Hopefully, tune up our thinking, thinking biblically about these things. Uh, start at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For since, let me get my other side up here. Something is not in the right place. There it is. Window is hidden. For since, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not come to know God, it pleased God through the, wis- th- pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. It's not the foolishness of preaching. It's the foolishness of the message. The Son of God crucified. That's the foolishness. To save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. We, not I, we preach Christ crucified. Like the apostles preached Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's about Christ. It's all about Christ. Christ is the head of the church. He is the life of the church. He's the savior of the church. He is the Lord of the church. It's Christ. We are his body. 
So if something else is constantly being preached, how can that be a church? I was thinking this morning, how many sermons are about Christ? Really? When you think, just think. There are sermons about everything, but how many are actually about Christ and Christ, what Christ does for Is Christ the focus of the sermon? Or is, is it simply biblical text? You know, <clears throat> some people, that, that's... If you preach the Bible, but you're not preaching Christ, what are you preaching? Isn't he the very word of God? That's one of the reasons I, I, I did error at the nursing home one time. I decided I'm going to go through Job. I don't like preaching the Old Testament uh, generally, except for as a reference from the New, because it is not Christ set forth plainly. And it, we're not under the covenant of Moses anyway. The, the Old Testament is background for the new. It is the priority must be on the new because Christ has come. In the Old Testament, he's a promise. In the New Testament, he's come. <clears throat> we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom, you have not pre whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which, uh, which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He's saying, you Corinthians, you'll tolerate anything. You're like little children. You put everything in your mouth. A different gospel, a different Christ, a different spirit of God. You have no discernment. For if I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Now, Paul in 2 Corinthians has to defend his apostleship. There are people in Corinth saying, who is this guy Paul that we should listen to him? Even though he's the one that brought the gospel to Corinth. Even if I am uh, untrained in speech, untrained in rhetoric, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things thoroughly we have we have been open among you we have not acted deceitfully what you see is what you get did i commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because i preached the gospel of god to you free of charge so it's not i i've heard this before I remember it was down in uh, Rio Grande Bible, Bible Institute down there, and I was arguing that we should not be charging so much money for video courses that were being sent to pastors down in Mexico. So why are we charging this money for it? Why don't we just give it to them? Uh, the answer is because if you give it to them, they won't value it. Well, at least that's the supposed answer. I don't know what the real answer is, but I said, wait a minute. This is, obviously, I wasn't. Why? Why would you charge the brethren? The wisdom of the world, that if, it's not, if, if it doesn't cost them anything, it's not valuable. Christ dying on the cross didn't cost them anything either. Maybe that's why he's depreciated, ignored, devalued. 
among so-called Christians and preachers. I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you in a need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. Then he goes down to verse 13. He's talking about, you know, <laughs> you have to read the whole context of several chapters here. Now he's talking about uh, uh, those who boast, those that have other gospels and other Christs and other spirits. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They are not of Christ, but they're pretending to be. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his servants, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Do you hear that? So Satan's servants disguise themselves in appearance. They, they, they infiltrate the kingdom of God pretending to be ministers of righteousness. Well, what's the righteousness of God? Christ, whose end is according to their works. So Paul is being accused of being a false uh, apostle. And these other ones are actually the false apostles that are accusing him. So let's go to another scripture. This is 2 Peter chapter 2. <laughs> Referring to the same kind of people. <clears throat> these are springs without water. Dry, dry springs. That, that can't save your life. You go out in the desert and you expect... You go now when you travel in an arid land back in those days. You'd go from water source to water source because you can't live for more than a day or so without water. A couple, actually, it's about three, I think. But I mean, you have to water your animals. You have to water yourself. So you'd go from water source to water source. You can only carry so much water with you. So when he came up to a spring that was supposed to be there and your, your life depended on it, and it was dry. Springs without water. Mists driven by a storm. For these are, uh, uh, for whom the black darkness has been deser uh, uh, reserved. Hell. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, arrogant words of nothingness, meaninglessness, of no value. Joel Osteen, arrogant words of vanity. And many others, not just Joel. Joel Osteen is just in your face vanity. All his possessions are vanity. His houses are vanity. His words are vain, are vain, empty. Superficial nonsense. You know, why do they call <clears throat> the thing in the bathroom a vanity? The thing with the mirror that uh, generally refers to women, but men do it too. They go there and you, 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 you uh, fix your outward appearance. It's just a, a, a front. It's not you. It's just the, the superficial. It's because, that's why it's called a vanity, because it's emptiness. The magazine Vanity Fair is actually named after something in uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Vanity Fair. It was a, like a fair, like a fair, you know, county fair. 
kind of thing where it had all the baubles and entertainment and the, the nonsense of a fair. It had no substance. So the magazine names itself after something as empty and meaningless. There's no substance in it. It's all about appearances and nonsense, like Hollywood. Nothing. Nothing of importance. Speaking words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. They go after the baby Christians who are still carnal, who haven't matured enough to discern the difference, and they are still living like they were non-Christians pretty much. Uh, so they're barely, barely, you know, it's like the, the seed is just germinated, but it, no, it's still far from bearing fruit, the seed that's planted in the soil. Entice them by sensuality, by their old man, as Paul might say, or the flesh. It appeals to that you can appeal to their flesh. They have no discernment. They're like babies that'll put anything in their mouth. You have to watch them, let's say, put something in their mouth that will harm them or kill them. Promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it and turned away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Hmm. Well, we're going to take a look at a half of a very short video. The first, oh, about two, two and a half minutes. I have not edited it. We're going to start at the very beginning. But I think, well, two minutes is more than I can stomach. And I do not wish to vomit all over the keyboard here. This is a video from Desiring God. John Piper's organization. John Piper's best-known book, Desiring God. Best-selling book. So, John Piper is telling, the title of this video, which is uh, posted uh, August 27th, 2020, relatively recent, is titled, Rethinking, uh-oh, if somebody does rethinking, well, y you ought to listen carefully. <laughs> It's like if I tell you to rethink something, if I, if, if, if I am telling you something that is sounds different, you ought to think about that and examine what I'm saying carefully. Make sure that I'm not leading you away from the faith delivered ones for all unto the saints. That I'm leading you to that, not away from it. Rethinking cross Centered preaching. Now you know why this caught my eye. Now, I didn't go looking for this. You know, the YouTube, the, the AI in YouTube threw it up on the screen. Rethinking cross-centered preaching. I might have searched for John Piper, and that might have been part of it, though. Rethinking, so so th that almost sounds like cross-centric 
Uh, so, now, uh, let me point out something. Luther, Luther said, and I agree completely with this, we must read the Bible in a Christocentric manner. In other words, it's all about Christ. The entire Bible. It's all about the, the, from the fall of humanity to the glorification, to the final state. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ's salvation, God's saving. It's about the fall and salvation of humanity. And that's all tied up with Christ. He is the Savior. He is the Creator. He is the Word of God. So if, when you... When preachers use the Bible in such a way that it is disconnected from Christ and from the gospel and from the salvation story, this broad story, and they use it as a source for other things, another message, they are misusing the scripture. I agree 100% with Luther on that. And here's John Piper saying we need to rethink that. Apparently Spurgeon, it says, it says down here, right in the uh, description, Spurgeon apparently lived by a preaching motto to uh, I or to, what is it? Let me get this other thing out of here. Take your text and make a beeline to the cross right. If you don't end up with Christ and him crucified, what value is there in it? If you're just using the Bible as an, a source of abstract information or how to have your best life now, it doesn't matter how much, how, how much scripture you use to justify that. It's not God's message. If you can't relate it to Christ, it's not God's message. It's, it's just extraneous data out there disconnected from God. You're just using God's words for other things that isn't God's purpose. We preach Christ and him crucified. Spurgeon preached Christ and him crucified. John Piper wants to think, rethink that. Let's see what John Piper says. And I, I, like I said, I can only go through like a half of this. <sighs> now, John Piper is a very well-known person. Many, he has many devotees. Not, I don't know if so much now, but he's pretty much retired. But, I mean, people that would pastors and others that they would not go through the summer without going to his conference. Very big name among the young, restless, and reformed. Among young pastors. One must ask why. Oh, I may get over here on the right screen. So, I don't think that the controlling question, how can I preach the gospel from this text, has, over the last 40 years or so, produced the kind of preaching that makes for strong, Bible-saturated, doctrinally rich, mature, stable, Countercultural churches with a passion for radical obedience to God's word. Okay, now <clears throat> do not be removed from the simplicity of devotion to Christ. First of all, this isn't about Christ. He is saying that Christ-centered, cross-centered preaching is bad for you. It doesn't produce good, mature Christians or disciples of John Piper. 
No, no, no. Because if, if you hear too much from Jesus Christ, you'll probably realize what John Piper is. You'll realize, hey, something's different here. Why am I not hearing Christ and him crucified? Could be this guy's not a servant of Christ and him crucified. No, it's not Christ's message. So this is so Piper comes one thing about Piper, he tells you where he's gonna take you right up front. Then he confuses you enough so you'll believe him. Who does things like that? There's a spiritual ent spiritual entity that's known to be very scheming and deceitful. But appears as an angel of light. Like a famous pastor. That's all about desiring God. And all about God's glory. But really it's all about your flesh. I don't think it has served us well. Preaching Christ and him crucified from the entire Bible has not served us well. Served us as in who? Who is the us here? Christ? God? His church? So I'm going to offer you an alternative. An alternative to Christ and him crucified. As I said... Piper's right up front. You'll get it right at the beginning of his message. To those who think that preaching Christ or preaching the gospel from every text means dealing in some general comments about what the text says, hovering just above the text, seldom explaining the very words and phrases and then moving on to the real concern of making a gospel crescendo with Christ and his atonement and the forgiveness of sin so everybody can walk out relieved. Um, in other words, the purpose is to get so into the words that you can't see the forest through the trees anymore like he did in this book which is not about the justification of God at all. It's about the justification of Calvinism. <laughs> it, it is a Calvinist um, apologetic based on Romans 9, <laughs> defending uh, absolute sovereignty in the sense of uh, absolute determinism. It's not about what Romans 9 is really about. But he gets really down into the weeds. Yeah, so you don't, so you lose sight of what's being communicated. So you get, you can get so far into the grammar and the word structure and everything else that it's not the message that's being communicated anymore. It's just creating confusion. So you lose track of the message, and then you put your own message in. Once you no longer know what it says, see, this is what the devil does. Once he so confuses you with the Greek and the Hebrew and all these other things, you see, that's not, the devil doesn't do that in order to help you understand what God is saying, because it is a translation we use. We're not, we don't speak uh, Koine Greek. So, Sometimes there, you need to clarify those things a little bit, but if it's not clarification, but rather what it is, it gets so far into these things, you lose track of the message, the opposite thing, and all of a sudden you think, I don't understand the Bible. I can't understand the Bible. Uh, it's only John Piper understands the Bible. And then once you, your mind is, is numbed and you become convinced that you're utterly ignorant, then John Piper will tell you what you have to think. It's brainwashing. To convince you that you don't really understand at all, so he must help you understand. Like rethinking cross-centered preaching. We 
We'll go into detail on John Piper a little bit in a minute. I think that kind of preaching tends to dull the expectations of the people. Preaching Christ and him crucified dulls the expectations of the people. That they might actually see fresh, new, beautiful, tough, deep. That they might see fresh, new, tough, deep. That you, you, you've got to have a new message, not the old message of the Scripture. Not the faith, that boring old faith delivered once for all unto the saints. We need something new and exciting. Piper will give it to you. See, not that old stale thing. Uh, oh, yeah, there was that, uh, I can't remember who wrote that book. I, I remember somebody wrote a book talking about fresh, I think it was Fresh Fire was the title of it, something like that. And he, in that book, I might be wrong on the title, he talks about those stale old letters, talking about the New Testament gospels and epistles. Now, we need fresh words from the Spirit. And this book was being pimped in a so-called revival in the largest Nazarene church in Danville, Illinois, well over a decade ago. How, you know, I, I, I like that, I, I went to this thing and I, I sat there, I think it was well over a decade ago, I sat there and I said, there's nothing to do with Jesus Christ here at all. These people aren't worshiping him. They had their, their singers with their microphones and swaying up front the women and a, a message that was absolute junk. You know, you could tell the, the evangelist had given it too many times. It was just a canned message, and it, it had no, he had no passion. It was just delivering this canned message. It was the most boring thing. So I was up there worshiping God by myself. It's like, huh, well, I'll just do my own thing here because there's, there's, the Spirit of God is obviously not there. And they were, they were pimping this book that talked about the, the stale old letters out in the entrance, the, the lobby, that's the proper word in this case, of the church. A Nazarene church, not a United Methodist church, not an Episcopalian church, not a PCUSA church. And you can find the same kind of stuff going on among independent fundamental Baptists and all kinds of so-called Bible believers. Scary, wonderful things in the text. So I, I can dig up all kinds of things you've never found in the Bible before. Yes, you can, John Piper, because it's not of the Spirit of God. The, the gospel's an old message. If somebody has a new message, guess what? It's not of God. Scary, wonderful things in the text. I think it tends to treat the actual words and phrases and logic of the inspired text as having minor significance. The actual words and phrases and logic are simply there to communicate the real message. If you, if you focus on the words as words and the phrases as phrases and the logic as logic rather than simply the communication of a message, well, you have confused the paper and the ink with the message. <laughs> the grammar, I mean, the only reason to look at these things at all is to, to make sure we are properly understanding the message. It's the message that counts. What is God saying? That's the only thing that matters. And if you're not delivering that, if you're delivering an alternative message, 
that you've managed to to uh, impose on the text. See, if people just talk about the text, they don't talk about the message. Something wrong with them. They're they're trying to to pull the wool over your eyes by giving the impression that they don't need to be treated with any particular rigor or care. They're just preparations for the main thing that's coming. Oh yeah, the gospel. The gospel. Oh yeah, that 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 ter yeah, the, the the Bible that that's oh, God forbid that you not focus on the letters and the grammar and the logic here and make room for the gospel. Christ and him crucified. God's salvation, God's Savior, the, the, the King of the church, the head, the reason for us gathering together. God forbid that we that we not get focus on the on the the grammar and the logic and the phrases and the words. Let's dig into this this book, this entire book is full of, of this kind of crap. It's just the whole purpose of this is to confuse you so you can't understand what Romans 9 is actually about. And, and to prove how much more intelligent Piper is than you are because you can't understand his logic. There's a reason you can't understand his logic, and it's not because he's more intelligent than you. He's nuts. No, actually, it's not nuts. It's the spirit of Satan speaking through John Piper. He is one of those ministers of Satan that describes that, that disguises himself as an angel of light. And he's deceived millions. Let's see if there's anything else I, I, I want to... I think it tends to train people in bad habits of how to read their Bibles. But yeah, yeah, training people to read their Bibles in a Christ-centered manner. As I said, Luther said that. If it's not about Christ, what's it about? This person, this guy is a devil in a gray suit. The devil. Diminishing the rigor and earnestness of meditating on the words of God day and night. I think it tends to. So, no, no, so, so Christ is not the message. It's the words. We got to study the words. Well, what's the purpose of looking at the words? <sighs> okay, that's enough of that. Um, it's just that Piper's so open about his heresy that it, it, it amazes me that he can get away with this, this garbage. And that's what it actually is. I mean, I didn't go looking. I, I never saw, saw this before this morning. I just happened to see it there, and I clicked on it five minutes long. And, like, yikes. He saw the title, Rethinking the Christ-Centered Preaching? Rethinking cross-centered preaching. That's the title of his thing. No, we don't want to do that. Who would tell you not to preach Christ and him crucified? Who could, would come you, to you with a message to not do that? Satan. So a minister is a servant. A, a servant of Satan serves Satan, a minister of Satan. Piper is a minister of Satan. Out of his own mouth, with his own title, in his own video from Desiring God, which is all about desiring your flesh. We read they they, they entice through the lusts of the flesh to seek to turn you to the flesh. So we're going to look at that a little bit. John Piper's book, Desiring God. Um. I'm going to look at, there is a section in here on conversion. <laughs> uh, the, the beginning, if you simply read the first paragraph of the preface, that should be enough. But if you read the introduction, you'll find out why Piper 
is not saved at all, but really seeking in a very subtle way to pursue the desires of his flesh. You know, using God for your own happiness. Uh, it's very in your face and open, but if you can't see that, I don't know. Either you're still carnal, still a babe in Christ, or perhaps you haven't been saved. Yeah, absolutely no spiritual discernment. <laughs> anyway, I'll just read the first first paragraph here in the book, in the preface. Uh, it, it starts with these words. There is a kind of happiness and wonder that makes you serious. This is what Piper likes to do. This is what Satan likes to do. He likes to throw words out at you that sound profound, but they're really gibberish. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis, who sounds profound and really speaks gibberish, in a thing called The Last Battle. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a gifted writer, but a her he was not a Christian. He was not a heretic. He denied penal substitutionary atonement and a number of other things. Uh, no, he's, you deny that, you've denied the gospel. If you deny that Christ paid the penalty for your sins on the cross, took the full penalty upon himself in your place, you've denied the gospel. I don't care who it is. If they deny that, they're a heretic. They have no salvation. They're still in their sins because you haven't believed the gospel. This, this is the first paragraph here under the quote, this is a serious book about being happy in God. It's about happiness because that is what our creator demands, commands, commands. So it's not about the gospel. It's not about Jesus Christ. It's about, this is a serious book about being happy in God. It is about happiness because that is what our creator commands. Quote, delight yourself in the Lord. Unquote. No ellipsis. Psalm 37.4. So Psalm 37.4 is about God commanding you to be happy. Not at all. Not at all. Just go look it up yourself. And it is serious because, as Jeremy Taylor, I have no idea who that is, said, quote, God threatens terrible things if we will not be happy. First paragraph in his book. Oh, and it gets worse from there. But what I want to do right now in this video, because he... He says, we shouldn't be preaching Christ and him crucified. No, you should be using the Bible without. You have to avoid Christ and him crucified. No, you get this whole big book. Let's do the everything but Christ and him crucified. Let's get down into the weeds. Well, let's take a lawnmower to the weeds, shall we? So he starts out in a chapter in conversion here uh, with a relatively... Sound, uh, it sounds relatively good. Uh, like uh, here it says, uh, for example, on page 61, Nevertheless, in his great mercy, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save sinners by dying in their place on the cross and rising bodily from the dead. This saying is trustworthy and de deserving of full of acceptance, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. Jesus, who was raised up for our trans trespasses and raised for our justification, Romans 4.25. Yep. Okay, so it starts out. See, this is how Satan does things. He gets you into a, a situation where you, you will accept what's being s said because it's orthodox. And once he gains your confidence, he sticks the knife in and twists it. He takes you off on another path. Something like that, depending on his particular mood. Uh, page 63. 
What must we do to be saved? Now, that question was asked by the Philippian jailer. What's, what must I do to be saved? And what was Paul and the apostles' answer? Well, Paul and, was it, uh, not Barnabas, who was there with him? Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, you and your family. Of course, that was said to a particular individual. Believe on the Lord. Yep. Paul had been preaching down in the dungeons for a while, so there was probably some other content that the uh, jailer was aware of. Not every then the Piper says after that quote quote here uh, he says uh, oh no wait a minute excuse me uh, uh, it's 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 number six on page sixty three what must we do to be saved the benefits purchased by the death of Christ belong to those who repent and trust in Him well that word repent Paul didn't say those who repent and believe. And repentance is wrong is usually wrongly defined as putting away your sins. The Nazarenes, in order to even believe in Christ, you must first repent by ridding yourself of all your sin. How can a, how can a sinner, an unregenerate sinner, put away their sins? That's what they are by nature, a sinner. Repent means change your mind, change your attitude. That, that's, that's what it means. Metanoia, a change of mind. This idea that it means putting away your sins is a tradition that's been added. So, And Piper agrees with it, by the way, that, it, that you have to do that first. No, uh, putting away your sins is a result of being saved, not the, a prerequisite to being saved. Uh, then he goes on and says, not everyone is saved from God's wrath just because Christ died for sinners. That's true. You have to believe. That's the condition, faith. Salvation comes by the grace of God through faith in Christ and not of works, lest any man should boast. There is a condition we must meet. Is, uh, there is a condition that we must meet in order to be saved. I want to try to show that condition, summed up uh, here in repentance and faith, not just faith, repentance and faith. Adding repentance, repentance as in putting away your sins. That's a work. Now, repentance as in changing your mind and believing the gospel. from Going from unbelief to belief, that is repentance. Changing your mind about and uh, repenting of your self-righteousness and looking to, to the gift of righteousness. That's believing in Christ. A conversion, and that conversion is nothing less than the creation of a Christian hedonist. Piper's a hedonist that calls himself a Christian. Conversion is used in the Bible only once. Acts 15.3 Well, the word, that particular word, Paul and Barnabas passed through both the uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. So why is the, what's the purpose of isolating the word conver, conversion that way? This conversion involves repentance and faith. Well, that verse doesn't say that. As the others report in Acts shows. Uh, now, re again, repentance, the, the, the word repentance, as it's commonly used in Christianity today, has, has its meaning uh, changed from the original idea of a change of mind to putting away your sins. Repenting of your sins. Search the scriptures 
and see if the Bible ever says, repent of your sins. It's a change of mind. It's not a change of actions. The word itself, it's metanoia. Literally, change of mind. It doesn't mean... In or if you have to repent, put away all your sins in order to. This keeps you from believing the gospel. The believing the gospel. The gospel is about God saving you, not you saving yourself. It's not about what you do. It's what God did. The change in your actions is a result of salvation, not the cause of it. It's a fruit on the tree, not the root of the tree. Then he says, uh, correctly, conversion is a gift of God. And then on the top of page 65, he says this. See, it's like rat poison. Look at the ingredients. 99.99 some percent is what they say inert. In other words, it's actually food. And it only is a very tiny amount of strychnine which causes you to bleed to death. You bleed out. You just start hemorrhaging and bleed to death. If you believe John Piper, that's what will happen too. You'll hemorrhage and bleed to death. Your faith. You'll be converted to a hedonist. Repentance and faith. So he says these, these orthodox things, and then he slips in the poison. Repentance and faith are our work. They are our work. Are our work. <laughs> but we will not repent and believe unless God does his work to overcome our hard and rebellious hearts. True, but repentance and faith are not our work. They are gifts from God. Work, besides, faith is always contrasted by the Apostle John, or, uh, excuse me, Apostle Paul, with works. Faith is not a work, it's not something you do. It's faith in what, trust in what God did. In Christ. Faith is not an act that you do to merit anything. It's trusting what Christ did for you. Satan is so subtle, he will twist anything. This divine work is called regeneration. Uh, well, regeneration is actually more than that, but yeah. Our work is called conversion. No. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ and not of works, lest any man should boast. The Apostle Paul, Ephesians, chapter 2, I believe. Conversion does indeed include an act of will by which you renounce sin and submit yourself to the authority of Christ and put your hope and trust in him. No. <laughs> no. Turning... The Bible does talk about um, conversion as turning toward God, turning to him. That is not the idea of, of you have to put away your sins in order to be saved. That's what Piper is saying here. Uh, conversion is our act of will, something we do, by which we renounce sin and submit ourselves to the authority of Christ. So uh, you have to and put our hope and trust in him. Wait a minute. No, no. First of all, God has to do something in you. In order to turn away from sin, 
God has to change your heart because you love sin. You can't turn away from what you love. We are responsible to do this. So we're responsible to, to put away our sins and make Christ Lord. Submit ourselves to the authority of Christ. Uh, at some point we do, but that's only after God has prepared us for that. You know, there's this thing called the, the conviction of sin that the Holy Spirit does where he convinces us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then it becomes in our, in our self-interest, even in our unregenerate state, we realize that uh, it, for my own sake I have to. But no, it's not. It, see, Piper confuses works and God's grace. He does not under... Well, Satan is confusing. Always Satan seeks to confuse grace and works. Look at Rome. They've been confused for almost 2,000 years. But just as clearly the Bible teaches that owing to our hard heart and willful blindness and spiritual insensitivity, we cannot do this. See, Piper is constantly doing this. He's mixing this and mixing that together. We must first experience the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah, exactly how that fits into everything and chronologically is a little bit hard. Okay, now, what I want to point out here is, so so Piper has a lot of orthodox scripture uh, and teaching here, but he's always mixing in this other stuff. And he talks about the new birth and salvation as God's work, but then he mixes in your work. And then he redefines salvation. This is kind of where things get. Well, see, he's been doing this all along, apparently, and nobody noticed. Because when he came out in 2017 and said, we're not saved by grace alone, everybody got upset. He did say that. And then he doubled down on it when he was called out on it. But he's been saying that all along. So if we go over to page 68 in this book, now, this is this is only one chapter. None, none of the rest of the book is about Christ at all. It's a bit like uh, the purpose-driven life. Yeah, the purpose of the purpose-driven life is really about you and your happiness, and that's exactly the same as Piper's book. It's really about you and your happiness. How to be happy in God. And you're going to hell if you're not. Piper's Gospel. So on one hand, he'll say like this. It is owing solely to the free grace of, of God. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy, Romans 9.16. We get no credit. He gets all the glory. Now, he doesn't, doesn't actually get glory at all anyway. He gives glory. He gives, God's glory is for us to see him as he is, to know him better. That, that's, that's, glorif that's how God is glorified in us. It's, it's not really, God doesn't become more glorious. He only becomes more glorious in our perception. God does not lack glory. <laughs> he does not lack importance. That's what the word glory really means. How do, uh, he, he, it's as we esteem him more, we are glorifying God in our, uh, in our thinking of him. It's not that he's changing. You don't have, you can't add to God's importance. But, always watch out for the buts. But if salvation refers to justification, there is one clear condition we must meet. We are justified by what? Grace through faith in Christ. 
what, what does Paul say? We are justified through faith, justified through faith, justified through faith, and not of works. The entire book of Romans is about that, basically. Most of Paul's, it's always, it's always in all Paul's epistles that justification, being right with God, being made right with God, is not about works. It's about what God did and simply believing what God has done. We're justified by that. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 10, Paul says, With the heart, man believes unto justification, unto righteousness, being right with God. Being made right with God. It all means the same thing. And with the mouth, confession is made onto or into salvation. Both of them is really into it. The word is ice. It means into. But it's also often used, translated as for, for the purpose of or something. But into it. It's, you think about it, you'll understand why that's that way. So if salvation refers to justification, but if, if, a but if, that I don't know, there is one clear condition we must meet, faith in Jesus Christ. True. And if salvation, we're being taken down a path here, not the gospel path, not the narrow way. We've been taking down a bypath right here. But if salvation refers to our so if salvation refers to justification, oh my, oh my, Piper's gonna, Piper is going to take us into his two-stage salvation right here. And nobody apparently noticed it until he was very open about it in 2017. How did he get away with this? Well, it's Satan. Uh, so, but if salvation refers to justification, there's one clear condition we must meet, faith in Jesus Christ. And if salvation refers to our future deliverance from the wrath of God at the judgment and our entrance into eternal life, then not only does the New Testament say we must believe, but also that this faith must be so real that it produces the fruit of obedience. There must be faith in the fruit of faith. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So you're not really saved by faith alone. You must also add works to your faith. Now, f true faith will produce fruit because the fruit of regeneration, uh, God has saved us onto good works that he has prepared for us to walk in. He himself is in us working both to will and to work to do his good pleasure, which means that our good works are really God's good works, not our own anyway. But that's the result of salvation, not the cause of salvation. You have to be made into a tree that's fruit-bearing, a radical transformation in what we are. So, so what is so if and if so if if salvation, so this is let me sort of clarify what he's saying here. But if salvation only refers to justification, I'm inserting the only. There is one clear condition. There, there's only one clear condition we have to meet, uh, faith in Jesus Christ. That, that, that will bring justification. But that's not really salvation, if that's only what salvation is. But if and if, really but if, salvation refers to our future deliverance from the wrath of God. So we're not delivered from the wrath of God by believing in Jesus Christ. His cross 
did not just see if you're justified you're right with God that's what it means to be made right with God you're not subject to his wrath we're no longer under the law if we're in Christ we have died to the law our works do nothing our good works do nothing to add to our relationship with God, to add to our standing before God. They do nothing to add to our righteousness. They are only fruit that comes from the result of God's work in us, from the new creation. It does nothing to justify us in God's sight. We are justified through faith in what Jesus did on the cross, trusting in Christ, who he is, and what he accomplished. Including his resurrection, because that's the evidence God has given to all men that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the coming judge. That he actually did atone for our sins. If your sins are atoned for, all your sins... Jesus died once for all, for the sins of the entire world. He doesn't have to keep offering himself like they do at Rome. It was a once-for-all sacrifice, a once-for-all payment for all sin. So he, he's being very, very deceitful here. He's leading Satan. Is, this is Satan speaking. Really, really. And if, sal and if salvation refers to our future deliverance, actually there should be a but there, but that would be too obvious. If salvation refers to our future deliverance from the wrath of God, so in other words, believing in Jesus Christ does not actually justify you and deliver you from the wrath of God. Really. So you don't have eternal life. because you believe in Christ. No, that, no that what you have now is only temporary. It's, it's only probationary, apparently. Because it doesn't deliver you from the wrath to come, as the Scripture says it does. So if salvation, salvation, uh, salvation as justification does one thing, but salvation as deliverance from the wrath of God is something entirely different, apparently. De uh, but, but, or and, I'll reuse his word, and if salvation, see the word salvation here is in, in italics, in both cases, refers to our future deliverance, from the wrath of God at the judgment, first of all, there's two judgments. Nazarenes are utterly confused about this, too. There's a judgment seat of Christ for believers that has to do with uh, rewards. And there's a judgment, the general judgment, which has to do with the judgment of the dead. There's two resurrections. There's a resurrection of the righteous and a, resur a general resurrection. One is before the millennium, the other is after the millennium. Obviously, Piper's so caught up in the words and logic and the phrases and the grammar of the text, he doesn't know what it says. Talk about not being able to see the forest through the trees. Uh, but this is Satan speaking. So if, if salvation, so if it refers to justification, it's by faith alone. If it refers to salvation from our, uh, our refers to our future deliverance from the wrath of God at the judgment and our entrance into eternal life, he's denying that you have eternal life now, then not only does the New Testament say that we must believe, 
but also that this faith must be so real that it produces the fruit of obedience. There must be faith, and there must be the fruit of faith. Uh, faith by itself does not uh, that does not ha work is dead. The kind no, James is referring to the kind of faith. He's referring to people that say they have faith, but that faith doesn't have any effect on how they live. Very clear. Just look at James. If a man says he has faith, that's say-so faith. He claims to have faith, but has no. But that faith doesn't have any manifestation in his life. Does not change how he lives. Does not change how he thinks. Does not change what he does. He doesn't have faith. Real faith. Those things are. If you believe something you will act according to your beliefs. And with Christians, we have this problem. We have a new creation in us, and we still have the flesh with sin abiding in it. So we don't act consistently with our faith. Have you noticed? but because we're justified by faith alone in Christ. See, Christ is the object. He's the what saves. Faith is merely the means that we partake of God's grace in Christ. It is not faith itself, but faith in Christ. The emphasis is on Christ, not the faith. Christ. Faith is only the access to the grace. The faith brings us into the grace of God in Christ. It keeps us in the grace of God in Christ. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. So now you have to have faith working through love. So he keeps adding things. The devil, This is the devil twisting the scriptures. If, there's, if you want to see a personification of the devil on earth, it's not really Joe Biden, it's John Piper. Not that Joe... Piper, uh, Biden is just a sock puppet. Piper is a minister of Satan. Serving him. Biden's just empty. Dead. Now, now, if you read, read the introduction to this book, and you'll find that Piper, that Piper never has a testimony of salvation. He, is, he, t he testifies about his becoming a, a hedonist, and he gives the evidence that his foundation was Blaise Pascal and C.S. Lewis, two non-Christians. Two, two uh, Blaise Pascal was a Catholic heretic called a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church. I think he, I recall, I think he denied the Trinity. Uh, he certainly would have died, uh, denied the penal substitutionary atonement. It's a little vague. I just don't have a perfect memory. But I know C.S. Lewis denied penal substitutionary atonement. He thought it was terrible. And other things. Not a Christian. If you deny that, you have no salvation. Now here, this is a, how, how did he do this? Because this book goes back to 1986, and people didn't even get upset with Piper until 2017. This is this is salvation by grace plus works. This is what Rome teaches. Uh, yeah, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, if you go back to the context of Galatians, what is, uh, Paul puts an anathema on those who add works to faith. Doesn't he? Isn't that what that whole book is about? The fatal error of adding works to faith? In that case, it was a work of circumcision. 
obedience to one command? Strive for the uh, for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Well, in the contents of Hebrews, which is about uh, admonishing Jewish Christians not to go back to the law, but to stay in Christ and salvation by faith, because they were under persecution by the Jewish community to return to Moses. So the, the, whole, uh, the holiness that we're supposed to pursue is the holiness that we have by being justified in Christ. It is not our personal righteousness, as he makes uh, clear and Paul makes clear. It is a righteousness that's given to us, a holiness that's given to us. Holiness has to do with what, who you belong to, not what you do. A holy vessel is holy because it belongs to God. Not because it's intrinsically holy in and of itself. The, uh, say the, 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 uh, the lamp in the temple. Apart from being go uh, the, the, the thing that God had commanded to be made and put in the temple... For his purposes, if it was just out on the street, it would just be a lamp. We are holy because we belong to God. That's the only reason we're holy. Not because of what we do necessarily. We do lots of things that are common, don't we? Just about everything we do is common. We think of holiness as a special character of a person. No. No, it has to do with who we belong to. I mean, there's lots of religiously holy people. But they're not holy in the sight of the Lord. So strive. We're supposed to strive for this personal holiness. That's the error of the Nazarenes. No, no, no. Uh, the holy, to strive to remain, uh, to, to hold on to Christ. Strive for the salvation that's in Christ, not of works. Again, when James talks about uh, the faith without works is dead, it's a faith that has no evidence that there's anything real to it is dead. In other words, it doesn't affect in you at all. I, I say I believe in Jesus but it makes absolutely no difference how I live. That is dead faith. In other words, it's you don't really believe it, because if you really believe something, it will change what you do. If you believe that Joe Biden is a sock puppet for Satan, you might not vote for him, right? But if you do vote for him, what does it demonstrate? You actually serve the devil. Just a hypothetical example there. I don't know what God wants to do with the election. Maybe he wants to destroy the United States. Maybe that's why Joe Biden is president. The wrath of God is on the United States, and Joe Biden is the instrument of God's wrath, just like Pharaoh was the instrument of God's wrath on the Egyptians. Think about that. <laughs> So how would I know who God wants to win the election? I don't know his purpose in it. When we cry, what must I do to be saved? So are you still crying that, John Piper? See, John Piper's unregenerate. The introduction to this book proves it. Proves it, absolutely. He's unregenerate. The answer depends on what we are asking. See, this is it right here. This is how the Satan works. Um, so the question, is it how to be born again, how to be justified, or how to be finally welcomed into heaven? See? Do you see what Piper's doing? 
He's separating justification and salvation, final salvation. This is a lie, and he was taught this lie at Fuller by Daniel Fuller. This is what the stink was about in 2017 when he came out and openly said this thing. But it was in his book all along. You know, but you get so confused in Piper's writing that you don't know what he's saying. He's saying it right there. This is satanic. Absolutely satanic. It has the subtlety of Satan. Really. I'm, I'm not exaggerating at all. Piper is a minister of Satan. Boy, Satan should really get away with some stuff, I'll tell you. So the, the answer, what must I do? So what must I do to be saved is not a question that, you, that, that means anything, really. So is saved from what? Like God's wrath? Saved from the slavery of sin? Isn't it like a one salvation? No, 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 no. We're talking about multiple different things here, apparently. When we cry, what does it mean to be saved? The answer depends on what we are asking. How to be born again? How to be justified? Well, what does that have to do with? Isn't like the deliverance from bondage of, to sin and the, the wages of sin, the death, which is the wrath of God, death? No, no, no. It's, we're, oh, no there's two different questions here. There's two different questions. Uh, how can I be saved? What must I do to be saved? Might refer to, to simply being born again and justified. Or it could be how to avoid going to hell. Two different issues altogether according to Piper. See how Satan works? He brings you in, uh, convinces you he's, he's orthodox, and then starts twisting words around. When we say the answer is become a Christian hedonist, we mean that God's work is new birth, our faith in Christ, and the work of God in our lives by faith to help us obey, to help us obey Christ. This is the fullest meaning of conversion. So what does hedonism have to do with that? And no, that is not. Faith does not help us to obey Christ. It is God who is at work in the redeemed person, both to will and to do his good pleasure. It's a union with God in Christ. So God's will and our new nature, the will, uh, our new will, are united as one in one spirit. And we are basically, that part of us is, in the image of Christ. Christ didn't try to obey God. He, he was God. There, there was a, his, his human nature and his divine will, divine nature were in perfect harmony. And so it is, manifestly so, partially so now, but manifestly so, when Christ returns and we're conformed to his image. Uh, that there is a, uh, we are at perfect harmony with the will of God. We are truly his agents. We're truly his children. We are truly in the likeness of Christ. And as Christ obeyed the Father, so also we will, from the heart, willingly. Now, t to a degree that's present in us now in the new creation, but it's not, pr we also have this this sinful flesh that is constantly a, pain in the side pain in his side <laughs> but we're not a slave to it so Piper is clearly teaching salvation by grace plus works which brings us to the second thing that becomes clear from our discussion conversion understood as coming into being 
into being of a new nature, a Christian hedonist. So the new nature is now a hedonist. That will obey Christ is no mere human decision. It is a human it is a human decision. It is no mere but oh, so much more. Repentant faith or believing repentance is based on an awesome miracle performed uh, by the sovereignty of God. It is a breath of a new creature in Christ. Saving, some of this is true. I'm not sure what, see, the problem with Piper, too, is once you start reading him, you can't understand anything he says because you don't know what he means by it. Saving faith has in it various elements. The nature of these elements makes faith very powerful, a very powerful thing that produces change in our lives. Unless we see this, or the array of conditions, the array of conditions for present and final salvation in the New Testament will be utterly perplexing. So there's an entire array of conditions for final salvation. Final salvation. Piper's word. Final salvation. You're not saved. You can believe in Christ. You can be born again. You can be filled with the Spirit. But you're not saved. There's a final salvation, and there's a whole array of conditions you have to meet for that, other than faith in Christ. What must I do to be saved? The answer in Acts 16.31 is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The answer in John 1.12 is we must receive Christ. To all who re did receive him, he gave uh, the right to become the children of God. Well, receiving Christ is simply believing on who he is. It's not necessarily receiving, confessing him as your Savior and Lord. What does Paul say in Romans 10? Two things. In order to be saved, we do what? With the heart, one believes onto righteousness or into righteousness, into justification, right? Being right with God. And with the mouth, confession is made into salvation, identifying yourself with Christ. So it's both believing in who Christ is and what he accomplished for us and also identifying ourselves with him. So you can receive Christ as Savior and Lord as far as acknowledging who he is and believing that. But that isn't the... Many disciples, there were many that believed on Christ but did not identify themselves with him because they were unwilling to pay the cost of doing that. So that's... Uh, we have to go by what, when the scripture teaches what you have to do to be saved, it's, so, Piper does not actually understand the Bible, because he's unregenerate. Uh, he is, I mean, just read the introduction to this book. The answer in, uh, in Acts uh, 3.19 is, repent therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent of what? your self-righteousness, and believe in God's righteousness, his gift that's in Christ through faith. Piper doesn't understand the Bible. He just confuses you so much and spins things around. You think he understands it because you can't. You won't understand it when he gets done with you. The answer in uh, Hebrews 5, 9 is obedience to Christ. Christ became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life in John 3, uh, 36. Uh, okay, let's, let's take a look at that because I think that's an important uh, verse. This is uh, whether it's Jesus speaking or the Apostle John. Or, I mean, John the Baptist is. No, let's. 
Just forget what I just said. I can't do two things at once. 336. Okay. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Has. Present tense. But he who does not obey. Now, the word here, obey, is apitheo. Uh, and it can mean it's disobedience. In what way? Not believing in the Son. So you could translate. I think that word would better be translated. Uh, he who refuses to believe. This definition from Strong's is not sufficient. Uh, so it's. So here. The 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 the, the word the word is also related to faithlessness. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go at the context here. So always look at the context. If you get confused, look at the context. So what is what's what's set up here? You go up to John three sixteen. What is it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him doesn't say obey. It says who does whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now. Faith does produce obedience. If you really believe someone, you'll listen to them and do what they say, right? Because you trust them. You trust. Faith and trust, the same word. Same word in Greek. And it also has uh, connotations of faithfulness. So if you believe someone, you'll be faithful to them. Uh, let me give you uh, an example. Well, I don't want to use Biden. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are really devoted to Trump. So if you believe in Trump, you will listen to what he says. And you'll follow him, right? Just using a contemporary ridiculous example. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it's not simply believing who he is. It, it also, faith involves a, a commitment, a, a trust in him. And that's why the word, it can also be translated as faithfulness. It has to do with the relationship, not simply a fact. It's not simply knowledge of facts. That's not biblical faith. So you, you can believe that the, the uh, the Pharisees and the temple authorities were well aware that Jesus could do miracles, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and because he did that, they determined to get rid of him. As Nicodemus says, he was, he was one of the San, members of the Sanhedrin, he said, and he said, we know. So the Jewish authorities, Nicodemus was one of them of their Sanhedrin, their, their Senate, said, we, he didn't say, I know, he said, we know that you are from God because no one who is not from God can do the things you do. See, but the authorities, in spite of their knowledge that Christ was from God, sought to put him to death. They knew. They had witnesses there that saw him raised Lazarus from the dead. And because he raised Lazarus, they were determined to kill him because of their selfish motivation. The motivation was this, that if this man keeps going on like this, all the people will, will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away our position. Why? Because we are not able to keep, keep the people in, under control. If the, the Romans would law, allow local governments uh, to control things, unless they didn't, then they would move in. The reason there was a governor in Judea rather than a local king like Herod is because Herod was unable to keep the Judeans under control 
And the Romans wanted everything nice and calm. They did not like revolutions and war. So if the local authorities wouldn't do it, they would take, remove them and come in themselves and run things directly or replace the local authorities. So they wanted to hold on to their jobs and were willing to kill a prophet of God. It was the very least they believed about him. They knew he was from God and he was doing miracles and teaching the people. They were willing to kill Christ in order to hold their positions. Not Nicodemus, though. He was not everybody in the Sanhedrin. So here, he sent his, did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but the world should be uh, saved through him. He who believes, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already. So what is the difference here, really? Believing and not believing. Believing in who he, well, it's like when uh, Paul says, if you believe that, that Christ has been raised from the dead. Well, that has a lot uh, to do with who he is. As Paul also says, that that is the evidence God has given to all men that Christ is indeed the Messiah, the appointed one, the promised one, who will judge the world in righteousness. When he preached to the, uh, the, to the Athenians, he was preaching judgment. <laughs> At that point, not the gospel. He was preaching that Christ is coming to judge. And here, Jesus Christ himself is saying this, that, uh, that he that does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, judgment is based on whether or not you believe in Christ, not on the Ten Commandments or the 613 Commandments or the Two Commandments. It's based on faith in Christ or not believing in Christ. And this is, let me take a look here at something. Oh, by the way, b believing in, and not believing are, are present participles. So that, it means like it's sort of like an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time thing. It's a characteristic for your life. It, it functions like an adjective. So a believer is it functions like a verb that functions like an adjective that functions like a noun. The present part, the participle with a na with a, a definite article in front of it. Uh, it comes out in English, believer. So this is it's something about the person. It's not a simple one-time act of faith. It is a characteristic of the person. It's identifying characteristic of the person. That you're a believer in Christ is not just, well, I believed this. It's, no, I'm your believer, your follower, your, uh, you trust in him. Dis disciple of him, you can, all these things. It's It's not simply believing some facts about him. You can believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You can believe that Jesus is the messenger from God and seek to crucify him like the authorities did. That was my point in all that. <laughs> and this is the judgment here that light has come into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. The gospel is the light of the world. Uh, the, the apostles, he said, you are the light of the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light. This is like prophetic of what they're going to do to them. For their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds should be uh, manifest as they have been wrought, done in God. Okay, <clears throat> so... So that John 3, 36 is about Christ and your relationship to him. It's not about 
you're not you don't have you you obey Christ because you belong to him no, you don't belo- obey Christ in order to belong to him you don't obey Christ in order to be saved you obey Christ because you've been saved piper actually says that but then he flips around in his own head and says something opposite piper does not understand what piper is saying how can anyone else say what understand what piper is saying This is getting long. Sorry about that. I, I just can't do it faster. It's not... I, you. With Piper especially, I mean, you've got to... He's a mess. Okay, so we have uh, all these conditions. Uh, in John in Acts uh, 3.19, of course, he said... Um, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent of what? In Acts 3.19, he's speaking to a Jewish audience. Your self-righteousness. What was John the Baptist's message? See, these, these were religious Jews. They thought they were right because of keeping the law. But they didn't keep the law. Not sufficiently. The law condemns. It does not save anyone. Through the, through the law is the knowledge of sin. It can't give life. Jesus himself, so, so there's a whole array of, of conditions. Uh, and he claims uh, Hebrews 5.19 is obedience to Christ. Obedience to Christ in what? What did Christ say? He that believes in him has eternal life. Faith in Christ is obedience to Christ. He didn't say, if you keep the commandments and believe in me, you have eternal life. Now, you have to remember, too, that with with Jesus, often he is preaching the law to condemn people in order they can see their need for, for something else. And the gospel is not clearly revealed until after the resurrection. But you always have to look in the context. So faith, the Jews knew from the law of Moses that when the Messiah came, they had to believe in him or they would be cut off from God. Moses said that. And again, you know, uh, Hebrews 9, uh, 5, 9, uh, Christ became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Well, to obey Christ is to believe in him. Obey him. What does he say? He that believes in me has eternal life. Has, not will have, at the final judgment. You already have it. If you are a believer in Christ, you have eternal life. Eternal life is in the Son. If the Son is in you, you have eternal life. Uh, Okay. For example, another condition. Matthew 18.3, he said that childlikeness is a condition for salvation. No, it's not. Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. We also said, unless you're born again. Do you suppose there's a connection between what Jesus was saying? Now, this is sort of encoded. Jesus, Jesus spoke in spiritual language so the people wouldn't understand. That's why, why do you speak in parables? And what was his answer? So that hearing they would not hear, and see, uh, they would not under, you know, in order they would not understand until after the resurrection. It was not that they would permanently not understand. It was like he had something he had to accomplish, and that was die for our sins and rise from the dead. Couldn't accomplish anything until that. So all this other stuff was preparatory. 
So, uh, so child likeness is a, well, what, what's it talking about here? You actually just simply believe. See, uh, being not childlike is try, like trying to make a deal with God. A child just asks, can I have some? They don't know enough to try to make a deal with you. A young child just hold out his hand. I'd like some. You say, ask. Seek. What do you say? Seek and you shall find. Ask and shall be given unto you. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. That's childlikeness. You just, just ask. Instead of trying to earn it. Trying to, to buy it. Trying to make a deal. That's what adults do. Not children. Mark 8, 34 through 35, the condition is self-denial. If anyone uh, would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, he was talking about being his disciple at that time in that place. Where was he headed to? The cross. This is, he's not talking to us today. Th that we're in a different context. It is true in a sense, but not literally. They were literally in a place where they might have to take up their cross and go and get crucified if they were going to follow him, because that was what was about to happen to him. It's, it's, see, to deny yourself is to deny your very life. To, lay, to be willing to lay down your life, it is not simply giving up chocolate or something. Matthew 10, 37. Jesus lays down the condition of loving him more than anybody else. This is the fruit. All these things are the fruit. The being willing to, to lay down your life, being willing to, uh, loving Christ above all other things. This is the result of being saved, not the cause of being saved. Piper is a heretic, a servant of Satan. Piper is not regenerate. I mean, just look what he writes himself in his introduction to desiring God. Uh, I'll, I'll do a separate video on that, I guess. In Luke uh, 14, 33, the condition for salvation is that we be free from the love of possessions. See, these Piper is saying these are conditions we must meet in order to be saved, finally saved. This is a lie from hell. Piper is a minister of Satan, a servant of Satan. Speaking Satan's words. This is Satan's message. The only condition for salvation is faith in Christ. Even confessing Christ is a result of believing in Christ. See, you can give a false confession, and you can claim faith. You're not saved. Faith, we are saved by the grace of God through faith. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All the other stuff, uh, as a result of God's regenerating us and giving us a new heart and a new spirit and all these other things, are the fruit of salvation, what the new man produces because God has transformed our nature and left us in a body of sinful flesh for a while. Not for very long, I hope. Not for, we can all go at once. That'd be. Uh, but th this is this is, Piper does not understand salvation at all. I'm assuming he's simply ignorant, and not deliberately trying to damn everybody. That's what the person that's speaking through him is seeking to do. So. Yeah, you have to you have to make yourself love God more than everything else. Uh, no, no, this is 
Piper is very confused. Uh, we are not saved by fruit. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ. Fruit is simply what the tree produces. The tree is the tree regardless. An apple tree is an apple tree even if it doesn't produce fruit that year. It's still an apple tree. And the nature of the apple tree is to produce fruit. The new man that's created in us, we are a new creature in Christ Jesus, created in Christ. And onto good works. The, the nature of the new creation that produces that God produces in us in the new birth is such that it will produce fruit under proper circumstances. The thief at the cross was, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. That thief did have had no good works at all other than believing that Christ was the Messiah. Other than faith. None. And he was nailed to a cross. He couldn't do anything good. But yet, that was sufficient. All you have to have to be saved is faith in Jesus Christ. And God changes us into a creature that produces good works, but not because we try. It's not a condition. An apple tree is not an apple tree on the condition that it produces an apple. The apples are the fruit of the tree. During a bad year, you might not have apples or very little apples. Other years, you might have an abundance of apples. But because it's an apple tree, the nature of the apple tree is to bear apples to produce good fruit. Wheat seeds, by their nature, will produce wheat under the proper conditions. Drought might hinder, disease might hinder, a fire might hinder, but the wheat is still wheat. It doesn't have a, the wheat does not become wheat because it bears the, the grain head. It is always wheat even before it produces the grain because of its nature, what it is. A Christian who does not have, all Christian, faith is good. We will have good works simply because we're Christians, because that's the nature that God has put in us. We are not the same as we were, but that is God's workmanship, not ours. We get no real credit for it. We're simply doing what we want to do. Wheat doesn't get credit for bearing grain. It's simply the nature of wheat to do that. So Piper needs to go to Sunday school class and get saved. Okay, another condition. Uh, the, uh, Luke, Luke 14, 33. Now, again, we're back in the Gospels where Jesus is almost always preaching the law. Uh, uncovering the law from the traditions because the purpose of the law, the primary purpose of the law is to convict you of your sin. It reveals your sinfulness and hence your need for a Savior. The condition of salvation is that we be free from the love of our possessions. Any one of you that does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. See, these, he's made these into conditions. If you're truly a disciple of Jesus, you would be willing, if you were forced to, to renounce all your possessions. If it was of a choice between Christ or your stuff, let's say this happens. The, uh, the, the, the FBI comes to your door, uh, the jackbooted uh, black... Uh, SUV, uh, you know, in, in the, the General Motors Suburbans, they come to your door uh, in their riot gear, and they say, we we know you're a Christian. If you renounce Christ, you can keep your life, you can keep your possessions, you can keep everything. If you don't, we're taking you away, and we're going to execute you tonight. 
Which will you choose? If you believe in Christ, if you believe what Christ has given you, you'll say, oh, you, you, want me, you want to send me home? Fine. I will not renounce Christ. Probably millions now over the years, over the centuries, have, has made that decision. In the Middle East, ISIS comes to your door. We know you're a Christian. If you do not renounce Christ and confess Muhammad, we are going to take your head off right here in front of your family. And then we're going to execute them. You have a choice. Do you believe Christ or not? Would you want to make that choice? No. Who would? But would you? If you truly believe in Christ, you will choose him because not only because of that, but because the Father keeps you. And he's given you a new nature that will confess Christ. You're not simply a sinner that's, that's holding on to a string. No, it's Christ in you. He will confess himself through you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is not a condition of salvation. That is the result of salvation. So, Piper has the gospel absolutely upside down, and he believes in a gospel of works. Faith plus works. In his own words, in his own book. That he wrote in 1986 and is still being printed. The Christian hedonist. See, a hedonist lives for himself, which is absolute proof. You know, you go into, like I said, just read the introduction. Piper got none of this from the Word of God. He got this from Blaise Pascal and C.S. Lewis. But it appealed to Piper's flesh because that's all Piper was. He was unsaved. And he continues to be unsaved. He has not repented of any of this. As we saw in the short video, we don't need, we need to get into the text. None of this preaching Christ and Christ crucified. He doesn't want Christ. He thinks preaching Christ is an error. Preaching the gospel is an error. That's the same old thing. Salvation by faith in Christ. We don't need that. We need more Bible. Well, what is the, when Piper exegetes scripture like this, who's being glorified? Well, who has a big name in the front of the book? Piper. The exegetical theological study of Romans 9, 1 through 23. Page after page of nothing but theological gobbledygook that glorifies not God, but John Piper. This is all trash because it doesn't convey the true message. It obfuscates, conceals the true message of Romans 9 and instead glorifies the genius of Piper. All about Piper's glory, not God's, in spite of what Piper says. <sighs> well, how long have I gone? Oh, two hours, just about. <laughs> One more minute. Now, the gospel of Jesus Christ is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He that believes in Christ, who is a believer in Christ, has eternal life. Not maybe, someday, if you meet all the conditions for final salvation. You are saved. Your sins were paid for on Calvary almost 2,000 years ago. Counting down to a little tiny few more years. It'll be exactly 2,000 years for since, well, we don't know exactly 30 A.D. or 33 A.D., whatever. Doesn't matter. Christ paid for all sins, period, then. It's done. Past, present, and future. You're, if you believe in Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, trust in him and what he's done. You are justified before God. You are right with God. You don't have to meet Piper's conditions. You have to meet what Jesus said. 
He that believes in me shall not perish but have eternal life. You have it because you have Christ. And Christ dwells in you. If you believe in him, really trust in him, and not simply a doctrine or and because you trust in him and because God regenerates in you, you will produce good fruit. Under the proper conditions, according to the will of God, he is at work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. He has appointed good works for you. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to go find them. You'll simply do it. You'll, just, like, just like wheat simply bears wheat grain. And apple trees bear apples because of what they are not because they strive to produce things. We are, so, we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Don't get lost in the weeds, and don't let Satan deceive you through his subtlety, through his word twisting, through his disciples, his ministers that appear as angels of light in the church. And among Christians. It's not that hard to figure out who they are. Do they actually point you to Christ and the gospel, or do they try to point you to something else? 